All right, let me first of all deal with a few prayer requests. One that was handed to me this morning. Uh, this comes from Jenny. She works uh, in our sound booth during our other two services. Is requesting prayer for her Aunt Carol Avance. She's in the hospital in Arkansas. Uh, she has thyroid issues and she is very, very weak. Uh, I want you to be praying for David Dukes. I visited with him yesterday after I got home. Uh, as you know, they did a biopsy. They've determined that he has a glioblastoma class 4 brain tumor. Very, very serious. He starts radiation treatment either Tuesday or Wednesday this week. So please be praying for him as he begins that treatment. Mike Rasmussen, uh, new to our church this year, gave his life to Christ in a hospital room at Clovis Hospital. Uh, since then, he's had over 25 radiation treatments, and he has about six more to go. He's been diagnosed with a stage four cancer in two different locations in his body. Mike is doing very, very well. He's just a young man. He's, uh, he's in his uh, late 30s. And um, some of you volunteered to be part of a group that calls and checks on him, and you're doing a great job. Thank you for helping out there. Um, the McDonald family, they are new to our church. They moved to California. I believe it was from Kansas. Mark, Kansas or Missouri? Kansas, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> you probably haven't met them, uh, though they've been here almost every Sunday. And uh, the reason you haven't had a chance to meet them is because they stay in the nursery and they watch the service on the TV screen in the nursery. They have a toddler, two years old. Uh, her name is Morgan. She is in need of a heart-lung transplant. It's the reason they are in California, is to be near a children's hospital that can help provide care for them. Uh, they, they made their way down knees looking for a church home, all right? Uh, and they said they found it when they found New Hope. And so we're very excited about that. And so um, I heard that while I was gone, uh, she had a surgery up at Children's Hospital this past week. The family is staying at the Ronald McDonald home there right now. This is a sort of a precursor to a transplant. They needed to get this surgery done, get her a little healthier so that when there is heart and lungs that are available, she would be prepared to receive those. So just be praying for the McDonald family. Uh, Pam Jarvis, what a go, uh, go around she has had with her knee replacement. Uh, she got an infection. They actually did a second surgery, which was just like redoing the knee replacement. Uh, took it out, cleaned everything up, put it back in. She continued to have an infection. Now what they've done this past week is gone in and put what they refer to as a cement knee in. She will have it for a couple of months. What that basically means is there is no bend in the knee. It will be kept perfectly straight. Uh, she'll be in a wheelchair for the next couple of months. This device is supposed to absorb the infection, all right, to help get it out of her body. Um, the, the challenge now is, is after this surgery, she's been placed in ICU because she's now sepsis. All right, so she is just going through a huge series of challenges with this, what is normally a very traditional knee replacement surgery. So please be praying for Pam and her husband. Michael Polson he and his wife Debbie have been part of our church for several years. Mike's mom went under hospice care yesterday. She's at St. Agnes Hospital. Got a text from her this morning, uh, from him this morning, simply saying, uh, Mom is very weak, Mom is very pale. Uh, just continue to remember her and them. Bob Benier from our church, uh, he's had a biopsy last week. Uh, he was home doing very well after that. Uh, they'll find out results Tuesday or Wednesday of this coming week. Uh, my grandson had an MRI done on his neck while I was gone. Uh, was complaining of a stiff and very sore neck at uh, preschool. Uh, they took him to Valley Children's, ruled out the things that you normally think of with a stiff neck and a child. Uh, he has no fever, he has no swollen glands, uh, just a very stiff neck. But at the end of the week, they decided they should do an MRI as a precaution. Uh, more than likely, just something from kids being rowdy, all right? He's all boy. He doesn't um, have a sense of judgment. He leaps from high places without wondering what's below him, all right? So uh, um, he hasn't quite figured out he's not Superboy yet, all right? Um, Joni Anderson, she's been in Alaska for three weeks now. She's up there because her granddaughter fell into a fire, had third-degree burns while she's been there. Her son-in-law's mother passed away. Uh, just a lot of challenging events. She did send me a text this morning saying, 
hey, God is, being, is meeting their needs, and uh, they are so grateful for that. So those are the uh, updates on the prayer requests that we wanted to, uh, wanted to share with you this morning. So let's pause over those and just commit them to the Lord. Father, thank you that as a church family, we have the opportunity to share our needs. Sometimes, Lord, we keep needs very personal, but in our time of prayer, we can release those needs to you. So as we have shared several public concerns, I'm confident there are others in this room who I hope are releasing some private concerns to you. And those concerns don't always have to be of a physical nature. Sometimes we have spiritual concerns. Sometimes we recognize our own weaknesses and immaturity, and those are good things for us to surrender to you in prayer. Sometimes we're, we're struggling with emotions that we aren't sure how to handle, and Lord, instead of giving them to you to handle for us, we, we try to, to, to be ingenious and come up with our own plan, and Lord, this is a good time for us just to say, Lord, here's my thoughts, here's my emotions, here's my weaknesses, here's my concerns. I give them to you today. And then, Father, I think maybe the biggest challenge for us is that once we give them to you in prayer, we don't take them back from you as soon as we say amen, that we actually bring our needs, the burdens to you, and we leave them there. That's biblical. The Bible tells us to do that. And so I hope we can do that with you this morning. Father, thank you for what you have prepared for today's message. May it be your words and not mine. May it be your thoughts that drive us to a healthier relationship with you. And Father, may we learn what it is to be more dependent upon you moment by moment, day by day, week by week in our, work, in our walk with you. We commit this to you in Christ's name. Amen. We're still in the series. Joy and laughter, you never can have too much. You can only have too little. We're focusing our attention right now on the joy part. We spent a couple of months in the laughter part. And we're looking out of the book of Philippians chapter 1. If you want to pick up from there, we'll be reading verses uh, 12 through, uh, through 22 again. And uh, we'll pick up where we've left off. We're looking at, uh, at seven principles of adversity. All right, Things that, that Paul tells us in this passage that uh, adversity do for us in a positive direction. We often look at adversity as solely a negative direction. And Paul says this world is filled with adversity. And God can take the all things of life, the good, the bad, and the ugly, Romans 8, 28, and he can use them for our good. And so he shares with the, uh, the, the charter members and the current members of the church at Philippi. This is a church that he started and planted, just like Clovis Free Will Baptist Church is a church that my dad started and planted, and there's always a special place in your heart for those churches you've been connected to. And, and so Paul tells them in this opening chapter, there are some things that adversity do for us that are good and healthy, and we need to develop that attitude when we aren't facing adversity, so that when adversity comes, we are prepared for it. And so here are the seven things. Let me highlight them, and then we are going to look at two of them today. Number one, adversity promotes the progress of evangelism. There is good news in spite of the bad news. Number two, adversity provides opportunity for sharing personally. When we're going through adversity and others ask us, hey, how are you getting through this? It's a chance for us to say, my strength comes from Christ. The joy I'm experiencing in the midst of this traumatic situation is only because I know what Christ has done for me. And we can share those personal stories. Adversity produces courage in our faith family. When we see how others are going through adversity with the strength of Christ in them, then we get encouraged to share our faith even more. Adversity prov proves the character of our relationships. All right? How healthy, do we still hang out with you when trouble comes? Or do we run as fast as we can and leave you to your own troubles? So it tests our commitment to our relationships. Adversity provokes maturity in our lives. And we're going to talk about that today. Hopefully we get to adversity purifies our motives. And then last of all, adversity prepares us with a new perspective about living and about dying. Maybe you've been hit with so much adversity in your own life that you've begun to feel a little bit like a little girl who was riding along on, riding along on her bike when she bumped her head on a low-hanging branch of a tree. 
She ran into the house screaming, Mommy, Joey hit me! Her mom looked up from what she was doing and said, Sissy, Joey didn't hit you. Joey's not even here. He's at the grocery store with his dad. The little girl got this startled look on her face and said, You mean stuff like this can happen on its own at any time? Oh, what a bummer. <laughs> and she'd made an interesting discovery that day, and that is adversity can happen at any time in our lives. Just wait for the next phone call. Just wait for the next day. Adversity can show up at any moment. So today we're going to look at adversity provokes maturity in our lives. Follow along with me as we reread these verses that we've been focusing on for the last few weeks. Philippians chapter 1 beginning at verse 12. Now I want you to know brothers and sisters that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. If you haven't been with us in previous weeks, what's happened to Paul is he's in prison. <laughs> this, is, this is adversity, all right? He has been imprisoned and he has been beaten for his faith in Jesus Christ. And he said, this has not been a distraction, but it's been used to advance the gospel. As a result, it's become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others do it out of goodwill. The latter do so in love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is, that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I will rejoice. Yes, I'm going to say it again. I will continue to rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and the help or assistance given by the fullness of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, that what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed or become fearful, but I will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. So let's spend a couple of minutes looking at how adversity provokes maturity in our lives Viktor Frankl, and I told you a story about him a few weeks ago. He was a prisoner of war back in World War I. And he said, a weak faith is weakened by predicaments and catastrophes, whereas a strong faith is strengthened by them. I have often said, and in fact I just said it again yesterday, the middle of a tragedy is not the best time for a theology lesson. You see, it's easy in an environment like this, and I'm looking around, and I'm saying, okay, at this very moment, I don't know of a huge tragedy that any of you in this room are in. You could be in one. I just don't know about it. The most difficult one I know about in this room is Pam is your family, all right? Um, at, in the middle of those moments... When you get the first word of glioblastoma class 4 brain tumor, when you hear that your two-year-old needs a heart and lung transplant, at those moments, we are not really open to hearing the answers to the why question. Because there really only is one answer that we want. When we ask the why question, really the only answer we want is, why don't you make it go away? That's the answer we're looking for. I was with um, Chief Dyer for a little bit yesterday. And he said, you know, he said, Tim, I've, I had somebody tell me a long time ago that sometimes with the why question, what I need to do is write it on a piece of paper and put it in my pocket and ask God when I get to heaven. That I can't let it keep troubling me here on earth. 
But you see, some of the answers, there are some answers to the why questions. There aren't all the answers, but there are some answers. And we've kind of highlighted it before here. One of the answers to the why question is because I'm stupid. I did something bad. I choose to take drugs. I choose to put needles in my arm. I end up with hepatitis. I end up with other diseases. The answer to the why question is, I did this. I choose to, in order to have rest at night and in order to get through a day, I choose to end my day and begin the next day with a bottle in my hand. And 30 years later, the doctor says, you have cirrhosis of the liver. There's an answer to the why question. I made some poor decisions. I run a stoplight because I don't want to be late for work. And I get broadsided. There's an answer to that why question. Those are pretty clear. Though we still often ask why even in those moments. Another reason is God allowed it. God sent it. There are times that God sent tragedy in our lives because we're never going to learn a principle or grow up without some adversity. You can't grow muscle without adversity. Physical strength comes from adversity. You push your muscles to their limit. You push your lungs to their limit. Why? So you can do more the next time. So you can do more the next time. And there are times that adversity comes because it's part of God's ordained plan for us because we need it. And then the answer that we don't like is because I live in a sinful world. I live in a world that is tainted and is screwed up and it ain't getting better. And the scripture says it rains on the just and the unjust. And there are two applications of that tr truth. Number one is the blessings of God. Rain brings blessings. It makes green grass in Oklahoma in August. Hey, and that is beautiful. It's wonderful. It's great. And all of us get to enjoy the beautiful scenery, whether we're good people or bad people, whether we admire the scenery or whether we don't even give it a second notice. We still are part of the blessing, whether we recognize the blessing or not. The flip side of that story is there's a hurricane that in 24 or 36 hours is about to hit the coast of Florida. It rains and hurricanes on the just and the unjust. There will be good people who will suffer losses from a hurricane just like there will be bad people who will suffer loss in a hurricane. Why are there hurricanes? Because Adam and Eve ate an apple in a garden when they shouldn't have. Ever since the fall, this world, both geographically as well as spiritually, is degrading. The funniest part about, and I don't want to get off in political things, but sometimes I can't help myself. This world, we, we should do our best to take care of it. But we are not going to preserve it, folks. This world is not going to last forever. I don't care how much green work we do. This world is not going to last forever. I don't care how much we fight against global warming. Ultimately, the destruction of this world will be through global warming. The Bible says it will be burned up in a fervent heat. It's the way it's all going to end. And that's going to happen to the just and the unjust. But you see that lengthy, and I didn't really plan on doing that today, that lengthy explanation of the why question, and that's not the fullness of it all. When we are in the midst of a tragedy, we don't want to process all that. We just want God to make it go away. And so what is the quality of our faith when a tragedy comes? The quote I've often said is, in the middle of tragedy is not the best time of a theology lesson. And I've, I've added to that recently. Why? Because the noise of our frustration screaming on our head is so loud we cannot hear the whisper of the Spirit in our soul. 
Because the scripture says God speaks to us in a still, small voice. I, I sometimes come up with weird questions. And one this past week was, does God yell? But I found it very refreshing when I googled that question. I'm not the only one who's ever had that question. I found there were two pages, all right, of things on Google responding to this question. Does God yell? There are times I think he's yelling, but he really isn't. It's because I hear that still small voice in my head telling me what he's already taught me. It's kind of like your mom or dad reminding you of something they've already told you and you are living exactly the opposite direction and it seems like they're, do you always have to yell at me? I wasn't yelling, I was really talking very calmly. You're the one that's yelling. And how many times have we had that? Rain poured down and thunder boom one dark night in September in western Oklahoma. It had been a quiet, pleasant evening at the nursing center. Nurses and residents alike were enjoying the cooler weather when the scream of the local tornado siren tore through the night sky, warning of potential impending danger hovering unseen out in the darkness. The nurses and the aides looked at each other in surprise and then quickly began moving residents to safe rooms. One able-bodied resident sprang into action, quickly pushing one wheelchair after another into the small shelter room as frightened residents tried to comprehend the sudden change of events. After the residents were moved into the rooms, one 80-year-old resident, seeing the fear in the eyes of the frightened residents around her, stood up from her wheelchair and announces, I'm going to lead everybody in prayer. And she proceeded to do so. In the strongest voice that her frail body could produce, her faith-filled words rang out over the bowed heads of the frightened seniors group, and peace fell over the room as she prayed even though peals of thunder crashed through the darkness outside the building. At the end of the prayer, the woman's roommate, who had leapt to action earlier, helping to get everybody quickly into the sheltered rooms, then began to sing a joy-filled hymn, and soon everybody joined in the song. That night, in the middle of fear and uncertainty, workers at the center could hear the angelic voices of the residents resonating out with faith, from the safe room. What do you do? What do you rely on to get you through the storms of your life? You see, all of us put our faith in something. So the question for us over the next few minutes is, where is our faith? Is it in our job? Is it in our career? Do we find it in our education, in our own intelligence? Is it our friends, our relationships, our marriage? Is our faith in our children? How about the stock market? What do we rely on to make us happy, to take care of us, to save us from sorrow and sickness? Whatever our answer is, that's where your faith is. Whatever your answer to those questions are, that's where your faith is. We tend to invest our time, our money, and our energy into what we believe will make us the happiest. What will get us through life with the most advantages and the least inconveniences. Whatever we give our time and our money and our energy to, that is the power of what we really believe in. It, it, it could be our images. <laughs> I would be in bad luck if that's the case. It could be our careers, our education, or our relationships with God. Knowingly or unknowingly, we are worshiping it with our thoughts, our time, our finance, and our efforts. That is where your thoughts are. That is where your faith is. Everyone alive has faith in something. Our actions tell the truth about where our faith really is. For many, their words say their faith is in one place, but their actions speak much louder, a much louder truth. How you live shows what we really believe in. It, I don't think it was great courage that the woman and her roommate had that night in the senior citizen home. I think it was great faith more than great courage. They had faith that God would provide for them in the middle of this storm. They, they chose faith instead of fear. Their faith was so strong that it helped others not to be afraid. Have you ever thought about that in the tragedies of your life that others are looking at you? Your tragedy creates fear in those who love you. What are you giving back to them in exchange for their fear? How about a little faith?
Faith is simply trust and confidence instead of doubt and fear. If you have real faith, we don't need a lot of courage to face the storms. We just need Jesus. Ralph Waldo Emerson. Any of you all recognize that name? Okay, they still use him in English classes sometimes. Here's what he wrote many years ago. The gods we worship write their names on our faces. Be sure of that. And a man will worship something, have no doubt about that. Either he may think that his tribute is paid in secret in the dark recesses of his heart, but it will get out. That which dominates us will determine his life and character. Therefore, it behooves us to be careful what we worship, for what we are worshiping is who we are becoming. Adversity separates men. It either makes them better or it makes them bitter. Over 80 years ago, a well-known psychologist wrote these words, most people live, whether physically, intellectually, or morally, in a very restricted circle of their potential. They make use of a very small portion of their possible consciousness, of their soul's resources in general, much like a man who out of his entire body should get into a habit of using and moving only his little finger. Great emergencies and crises show us how much greater our vital resources are than we had supposed. As Paul faced the adversity of circumstances, he saw advantages. When he spoke of these events resulting in his own personal salvation, he was not talking about his conversion to Christ, but about his continued growth in Christ. Look at verse 6 of chapter 1. He said, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on into completion until the day of Christ. If you're a Christian, God's going to finish your spiritual maturity when he calls you home. Now here's the deal. None of you in this room probably did this. But you went to history class. And on the first week of class, your history teacher told you, at the end of the semester, there will be a 12-page turn paper due. Now, how many weeks in a semester? I forgot. I've been out of school too long. 18 weeks? 18 weeks in a semester? Yeah, nine weeks and a quarter, 18 weeks in a semester. All right, you got 18. They told you the first week. How many weeks you got to do it? 18. You got 18. All right. How many of you would wait till a night before it was due to write the term paper? Okay. And, and, and was it your best work? Probably, it was the best you could do the night before. All right. All right. You got to finish. You got it in. You know what? There are going to be a lot of people who right before they go to heaven... God's going to mature. He's going to finish the work. And it's going to be done at the last minute. And that's not God's fault. It isn't because God has a... It's not the teacher's fault. They told you the first week, week 18, there's a 12-page term paper due. God is telling us, I'm going to complete the work in you. If you allow him to do his work on a regular basis in his life, it's going to be kind of like Enoch out of the Old Testament. The scripture says that God came and talked with him in the cool of the evening every day. And one day, one day, the fellowship was so sweet between Enoch and God, the scripture says God just took him. He's a very small group of folks who went to heaven without dying. God just took him. I suggest to you there wasn't much difference in the Enoch that walked in the garden then walked into heaven. That's why God just took him. There was that consistent, growing relationship with God day by day, week by week, year by year. And God said, my work with you is done. I'm just taking you. All right. I'm just taking you. You cramming for finals? Or you're learning day by day to grow up in him? There were three things that were helping Paul accomplish the spiritual growth in his life. Let me see if I can highlight those. First, <clears throat> he took great comfort in the prayers of his friends. Paul knew the Philippians were his cheerleaders. Earlier in this letter, Paul said in verse 9, I pray. Now he was depending on the fact that they were praying too. In fact, in almost all of his letters, Paul cited the mutuality of prayer. What he himself practiced, he also profited from as he lived it out in the lives of others. 
In Romans, he said, I make mention of you always in my prayers. And now I beg you, brethren, friends, through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit, that you work together with me in praying to God. In Ephesians, he said, I do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. In verse 18 and 19, he says, <clears throat> Finally, my brethren, pray always for me. In 1 Thessalonians, he wrote, Make mention of you in our prayers night and day. Brethren, pray for us. In 2 Thessalonians, he wrote, Therefore, we all say always pray for you. Finally, brethren, pray for us. Do you get the picture of what was going on? There was mutual reciprocation in prayer. It wasn't just Paul praying for them, but Paul in prison found great comfort in knowing that the members of the church in Philippi, in Rome, in Ephesus, in Thessalonica, that they were praying on. He knew they were his cheerleaders. We ought to be each other's cheerleaders. We ought to be praying for each other. We ought to take this bulletin home and we ought to be reading the prayer requests that are in here. That'll be good for the video. My fa I have a face for radio. So. Um, but we ought to pray. Even if I, I don't know them, but they're part of it, I should pray for them. That is strength that gets us through the week. I, uh, I, I've, I've had multiple cheerleaders in my life. I've been so blessed. I miss my two biggest cheerleaders, though. I probably could say three, but mama's just a given, okay? There were two men who poured in my life at early ages. Malcolm Fry, he preached my ordination service when I was ordained at 22. Jack Williams had been my professor in Bible college. Some of you have met him. He's preached here before. He's now in heaven. But those two men frequently would send me notes before there was such a thing as an email. And then once email became available, those men on a regular basis sent me messages of encouragement, of hope, of prayer. You have no idea the difference that makes in our lives. Often when facing trouble, we are the focus of the prayers of God's people. And it is through these prayers that we are able to get through a crisis and go on to maturity. As members of God's earthly family, we should not forget to put the spiritual growth of others at the top of our prayer list. We only tend to think about physical needs, but we need to pray for each other in the spiritual realm as well. When we are experiencing growing pains, it's good to know that somebody else is praying for us. I've often been struck by the contrast in this verse of Acts chapter 12, verse 5. Peter was kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. He was kept in prison. God said, I want work done by you in prison. I'm not getting you out. But he still needs prayer, not for the escape from prison, but for what God's going to do in him while he's there. The second thing, Paul was not only sustained by the prayers of his friends, but also encouraged by the provision of the Holy Spirit. His language is picturesque. This phrase literally means the full supply of the Holy Spirit. If you have ever known the Holy Spirit drawing close to you in a moment of crisis, you understand why he is called the Comforter. Third, Paul's own determination was the third dynamic at work during this time of confinement. He was confident that he would come through this ordeal and he would see his friends in Philippi again. But here's the catch, guys. Paul was okay if he didn't. He believed that he would. But it was okay if he didn't. How do we know that? Because in this passage, maybe one of the most famous verses that Paul ever wrote, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I plan on being in Philippi. I'm going to live as if I'm going to be in Philippi. If I don't make it there, it's okay. Where I am is better. Wow. This, this, this spiritual determination that he talks about here, determined choices from a single focus. I'm just going to highlight them, and I'm going to come back to this next Sunday and deal with them just a little bit longer. But let me highlight these three elements that are wrapped up in Paul's spiritual determination to depend upon God regardless of the circumstance. He was determined to keep a clear conscience as he went through adversity. 
The scripture passage here that I highlighted as I read it, that in nothing I shall be ashamed. Sometimes we find ourselves in circumstances and we say, you know what? People would understand if I fall apart. People would understand if I challenge my faith. Yeah, we would. But what would be better? Is if in the midst of the tragedy, folks can see a faith that shines even brighter and hotter than ever before. We should not use adversity as an excuse for spiritual relapse or fear. The second thing that Paul determined was to keep a courageous testimony. He said, with all boldness, as always, so now. Often as we go through tragedy, we sort of turn down the volume of our faith. Not Paul. Paul turned up the volume. He wanted folks to know that God made a difference in adversity. And last of all, Paul was determined to keep a Christ-centered focus. He said, Christ will be magnified in my body, whether it's by my life or by my death. Magnified in our life. Let me close with this. One evening, an old Cherokee Indian told his grandson about a battle that goes on inside every person. He said, my son, the battle is between two wolves. One is evil. It is filled with anger and envy and greed and arrogance and self-pity and guilt and resentment and lies and false pride and ego. And the other wolf, his name is Good. And he is, he is experienced with joy and peace and love and hope and kindness and generosity and truth and compassion and faith. And the grandson thought about it for a moment and then he asked his grandfather, Grandpa, which wolf wins? And the old Cherokee replied, the one you feed the most. Which wolf are you feeding the most? See, we create our character by the choices that we make. Paul, in this passage to the Philippians, and the old Cherokee grandfather, are teaching that lifestyle determines our goals. Our goals don't determine our lifestyle. Our lifestyle determines our goals. Who are you feeding today? Which wolf is going hungry today? Let's pray. Our Father, we love you. We're so grateful for who you are. Thank you for the instruction you have out of the scripture for us. That sometimes it's not the instruction that we want. We would like the answer to the why questions of why don't you just take it away. But Father, you have reasons and purposes, even out of the things that we didn't cause by our own selfishness or sinfulness. But Father, you promise us that you will not waste anything that happens in our life. And Father, help us understand today which wolf we're feeding, the one for good or the one for evil, the spirit of God or the spirit of darkness. We may have some important choices to make today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Go have a great uh, day. And hey, take the day off tomorrow. <laughs>